1988, singer by the name of John Fogarty stood in a courtroom accused of plagiarizing his own work. A song off his solo record was similar to a song he wrote for his old band Creedence Clearwater Revival, and because he did not own the rights to his old band's song, the label accused him of copyright infringement. It was one of the most insane lawsuits in music history. Creedence Clearwater Revival was an extremely popular band in the 60s and 70s. Although they hailed from San Francisco, they played rock music that was heavily influenced by blues and country music from the South. The band sold 10 million selling singles and released six albums that charted in the Billboard Top 10 and were popular pretty much across the globe. Songs such as Have You Ever Seen the Rain, Proud Mary, and Bad Moon Rising continue to be well known today, but all was not well within the band and one of the main issues was the label. They were signed to an independent label named Fantasy Records who, according to the band, were not paying their fair dues. John Fogarty, the band's lead singer and chief songwriter said, quote, We were the only artists that mattered on the label. We were selling almost 99.9% .9 of the company's records. We had signed a contract thinking we were all in it equally. I thought we would share to a great degree in the company's success, but then it didn't happen. Fantasy owned the songs and they're supposed to pay me as the songwriter. The band broke up in 1972, with many of them leaving on bad terms. John's own brother Tom was in the band, and even they had fallen out too. So John Fogarty embarked on a solo career, but was still tied to the same label and was on incredibly poor terms with the label's owner, Saul Zantz. Ultimately, he wanted to break ties with this label once and for all. Fogarty recalls, I felt like I was their little prisoner in their dungeon, their little mouse in a cage that they played with. To take somebody that was at their height, like Elvis or the Beatles, and then treat them so badly is really a horrible thing. Eventually, Fogarty managed to rid himself of this label, but clearly didn't do too well at the negotiating table. He signed to Asylum Records, but only received the North American rights to his next album. Added to this, Fogarty had to forfeit the rights of all the music under previous agreements, so essentially the label now owned all of the rights to Creedence Clearwater Revival. Fogarty released a new album for his new label which performed poorly, followed by another album which was rejected by the label. So he decided to go on hiatus. But he was back with a bang in 1985 and released an album Centerfield alongside Warner Brothers. He used this album to settle some scores he had with Fantasy Records and had not one, but two songs dedicated to its owner Saul. The song Mr. Greed opens up with the lyrics, Mr. Greed, why you gotta own everything that you see? Mr. Greed, why you put a chain on everybody living free? And another song was a bit too on the nose and was literally called Zans Can't Dance, which includes the repeated chorus, Zans can't dance, but he'll steal your money. Watch out boy, he'll rob you blind. By 1985, Zanz had become a respected film producer and had won two Academy Awards for helping produce One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Amadeus. To have a high-profile singer release these songs was relatively embarrassing and somewhat damaging to his reputation, so Zanz threatened to take him to court. Because of the First Amendment, the U.S. is one of the most difficult countries in the world to win a defamation case. But the song Mr. Greed contained the lyrics, I hear you got away with murder, which seemed to have crossed a line. Zanz took out a $144 million defamation lawsuit against Fogarty, and this case was settled outside of court. The song Zanz Can't Dance was changed to Vans Can't Dance. But this was far from the end. Zanz clearly had some sort of vendetta against Fogarty by now and filed one of the most bizarre lawsuits in music history. On the same album that contained the defamatory tracks against Zanz was another song named The Old Man Down the Road. The label owned the music of Creedence Clearwater Revival, and they believed that the song had plagiarized Run Through the Jungle off the band's fifth album, Cosmo Factory. Fogarty was essentially sued for plagiarizing himself. And when you listen to both of the songs, there's definitely similarities, but the obvious reason why they sounded so similar was because they were written by the same person. As bizarre as the case seemed, it was not dismissed. In fact, it was going to trial. Nothing like this had ever happened before. Fogarty's attorney, Kenneth Seidel, told the LA Times, When we researched this, we couldn't find a case where a songwriter was accused of plagiarizing his own song. There was a case in which the artist Vargas was accused of painting the same girls in Playboy that he used to paint in Esquire, and there was a similar case against an artist who painted Cardinals for the Franklin Mint, 
and then went out and painted them somewhere else. But this is the only case that ever went to the jury over a songwriter accused of plagiarizing his own song. So in 1988, at the Federal District Court in San Francisco, Fogarty felt an enormous weight upon his shoulders. He was a successful musician and would be fine either way. The stakes of the case lay in what this meant for creative people and artistic expression. If he loses the case, then other record labels may be emboldened to do the same with other artists. Even beyond music, creatives who do not own the copyright of their work would be worried that they might be plagiarizing themselves in the future. Fogarty told Rolling Stone magazine, What's at stake is whether a person can continue to use his own style as he grows and goes on through life. I can feel Lennon, Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, and Lieber and Stoller standing behind me going, Johnny, don't blow this. Because it was the same songwriter for both songs, it was almost easier for the prosecution. For a lot of copyright cases, the prosecution often tries to prove that the plagiarizer has heard the song before. So recently, the lawyers of Marvin Gaye's estate made efforts to establish that Ed Sheeran had heard Let's Get It On. But in this case, John Fogarty had definitely heard the song Run Through the Jungle, mainly because he wrote the song himself. Factory Records had very few defenders at the time. The lawyer Ken Quartler wrote about the case on his blog and played devil's advocate by saying, The law must protect the integrity of an investor's acquisition. Were the artist free to create and exploit substantially similar works with impunity, he or she could diminish the investor's acquisition while recapturing rights already conveyed. Essentially, this song is something they own and their property, so it deserves legal protection like any other possession. Bogarty was so strong in his convictions that he decided to testify and take the stand. Prosecuting attorney Malcolm Bernstein asked him if he plagiarized the song, and his response was, there are so many ingredients to a record, there is more than one facet to inspiration. One of Bernstein's strongest pieces of evidence against Fogarty were the music reviews his album had received. And quite damningly for Fogarty, many music reviewers had pointed out the strong similarities between the two songs. Bernstein says, didn't the critics nail you for copying? To which Fogarty responds, no, they didn't nail me and I didn't copy. Another prosecuting attorney, Norman Rudman, had told the jury, the sound of the music is the best test. We ask you to trust your own ears. Saul Zantz, Fogarty's mortal enemy, was also brought onto the stand. Fogarty's lawyers asked him why he brought this case to court, and he explained that it wasn't even his idea. This was a bombshell that Fogarty was not expecting. According to Zantz, Credence's former bass player, Stu Cook, came into his office one day, played him both of the tracks, and said, John is ripping off Credence. You should sue him. Fogarty has written about this moment in his autobiography and said, I felt that I had been stabbed in the back. To intentionally go see Saul, a person who cheated and lied and treated us all like crap, and do that? I'm the guy who actually provided you with millions of dollars, Stu. So that strange bedfellow is the one you climb into bed with? Against me? Then came the penultimate moment in the trial. The California newspaper Desert Sun reported, After a week of conflicting testimony by musicologists, Rocker John Fogarty hoisted a guitar on the witness stand in federal court and plucked out a twangy tune he said proves him innocent of plagiarism. Fogarty gave the jury a short history lesson about the blues and rock and roll. He explained that this music has always relied on a limited vocabulary of chords and guitar phrases. He then played a song by Bo Diddley called Bring It to Jerome, which also sounded like both tracks and was released before both songs. This showed that blues music was all about borrowing and being inspired by other artists. When it came to the jury's verdict, it was unanimous. The jury voted 5-1 to one in favor of Fogarty, and he won the case. Despite this, the prosecuting attorneys were still convinced that they didn't lose because of the other side's legal arguments, but because of Fogarty being a famous musician. Bernstein said, We got upstaged by a superstar. And Feldman said, I think his playing for the jury was a very significant part of the defense. It overawed them. Not many people have the opportunity to hold in their hands a decision that affects someone larger than life. But Fogarty was not happy with this win. In fact, Fogarty had essentially spent a million dollars on legal fees, so this was a win that definitely left a bitter taste in his mouth. Fogarty even admitted, To defend myself costs more than the song earned. In 1993, Fogarty took Zance to court in the hopes that he would pay for his legal fees. And sadly, for Fogarty, this was denied by the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. While many people thought the case was the label's vendetta against Fogarty, 
Fogarty's legal team was unable to persuade the court that their lawsuit was brought out of bad faith and as a result, couldn't recoup the fees. This was a hill Fogarty was prepared to die on, so this case was brought up all the way to the Supreme Court. And instead of arguing that he sued out of bad faith, his team made a different legal argument. When the initial trial took place, there was a rule that if the prosecution won, Fogarty would have to pay Fantasy Records legal fees. Fogarty's legal team argued that there was a double standard and this was unfair. The Supreme Court had the final say and decided that Fantasy Records would have to pay Fogarty's fees. The judge eventually said, The primary objective of the Copyright Act is to encourage the production of original literary, artistic, and musical expression for the good of the public. The judge's argument was that copyright law was something that should help artists rather than hinder them, and it's in the public interest that artists don't create with the threat of being sued. Fogarty won this case in 1994, and you would think that, as time went on, the resentment between Fogarty and Zantz had died down. But in 2014, Saul Zantz passed away at age 92, and to show that no love was lost, John Fogarty jumped onto Twitter and posted without any caption a link to a certain song called Vans Can't Dance. Make sure to subscribe for more.